Hey out there, today is Monday, November 4th, 2019. My name is Matt Fury and this is The Rough Cut. Hello and welcome my friends, both old and new. Thanks for checking in on the podcast. It has been interesting times lately in the theater. Joker just became the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. And if you haven't heard it yet, make sure to check out our podcast with editor Jeff Groth. And you can hear about his experience cutting that film. Along with generating a lot of box office revenue, Joker has also spun up a lot of controversy and discussion ever since it premiered at the Venice Film Festival. And there's no doubt that it's a film that has a a pretty challenging storyline, one that makes a viewer think about how they're reacting to the film. The film we're talking about today on The Rough Cut, Taika Waititi's Jojo Rabbit, shares some parallels to Joker. First, it made its premiere at a film festival, except in this case it was Toronto, not Venice. It was a big hit at Toronto, just like Joker was at Venice. In fact, it took home the top prize. But considering the subject matter, it also got a lot of people talking about whether it was an appropriate part of history to be satirizing. But there's also been a lot of talk about the present day in our history to be the perfect time for a film like this. No matter which way you feel about it, you have not seen a film like Jojo Rabbit before. And for that, any movie lover should be grateful. Just as I'm very grateful to bring you today's guest, editor Tom Eagles. Plus, it's also, you're on the other side of the planet, so you know these things happen. That's right, yeah. Boy, where to start with this one? Um, you know, what I'm curious about is how you describe it to people. When someone asks you, so, Tom, what have you done lately? And you say, well, I got this new movie called Jojo Rabbit. How do you describe it? Uh, it's really tricky. <laughs> I mean, it's a little easier now that the film is out and some of the marketing's doing some of the heavy lifting for me. But I remember early on, you know, being at barbecues or whatever, and people ask me what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm doing this comedy about Nazis and the whole room were just kind of go silent um so yeah i don't know how i I usually just give people the premise these days you know a little boy who's um brainwashed in the hitler youth and and his mother's hiding a jewish girl in in the attic and and from that point people usually kind of understand the tension but then you have to explain that it's very well, it's funny, and uh, and the director plays Adolf Hitler. Yeah, there's that. How did Taika, what, how did he make you aware of this project, and how did he first pitch it to you? I mean, this project was um, been on the cards for a really long time. He was talking about it back before we did Shadows, even. You know, it was always like the next project, and then it wasn't. There was always something else that, that came up. So um, I was aware of it for a really long time, and it just sounded kind of bonkers to me until I read the script and then it all fell into place. And it's, you know, it's just such a classic Taika mix of comedy and, and real heart had a real emotional resonance in that child's point of view, which I think is pretty kind of consistent with some of his other movies. It does feel like a movie that only he could do. And you talked about just the blend of heart, you know, right from the first few minutes of the film, you know, when I saw it, the audience was laughing and laughing hard, but you could almost sort of feel a, should I really be laughing as hard as I am at this? This is very strange. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was a tightrope walk for us right from the get go. We always knew that it was going to be a funny film. And that's a big part of Tyker's filmmaking. But also, I think, with this project in particular, and in terms of kind of uh, reengaging people with the subject matter. And, you know, humor is such a wonderful tool for loosening people up and once you do that, you know, people kind of engage in a different way. So we knew that it was going to be funny, but we had to also give people permission to laugh up front. And so we had some cuts that were a bit more tentative in that regard, you know, where we kind of eased into the comedy. And that didn't really work so well. It, the thing that worked in the end was um, we had a couple of different versions of the opening scene, some with and, and some without Tyker's ridiculous buffoonish Hitler. And actually putting him into that opening scene kind of planted a flag and said, you know, this is going to be a comedy about Nazis and you may feel uncomfortable, but you're also going to laugh. And, you know, this is what it is. It kind of set the tone and struck a keynote right from the beginning. When you read that script, could you identify any places in the script? A lot of times editors will get the script ahead of time and see things that they know, well, this could be tricky once we get to the editing room or or even before this could be, you know, I I don't see this making the final cut the way you've written it. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a, also always a discussion right from the get go. I mean, Taika was writing and rewriting the end of the movie a couple of days out from a shoot. So we had various versions there. The thing that struck me was did the relationship between Jojo and Elsa progress in, in the right way? into that pace correctly and so that was something that we were playing with throughout the edit and i think i think we're both a little bit afraid that um you know spending the whole second act more or less locked up in that room would get a little bit boring for people and people would want it would get claustrophobic and want to get out and see the rest of the wider world you know we didn't want it to feel like a play that had been put up on screen but what we actually found was kind of the converse like the longer that you're away from that relationship and that relationship isn't progressing that's when the film started to feel like it lost its way a little bit. So a lot of the stuff that we took out was actually Jojo out in the world. He went to the Gestapo office at one point. There was a very long kind of hunt for Nathan, Elsa's boyfriend. And it sort of, by the time you got back to the house, you kind of lost the track of what he was up to. And so really we just wanted to keep that relationship moving through its uh, various stages, you know, from outright hostility through this kind of camaraderie that comes of a little bit of rivalry that you see in the Beethoven versus Einstein scene. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, eventually to, to love. It's kind of, you know, it's a love story of sorts. So there are, there are a few stylistic things that I, at least I thought I noticed in the film. One is that it seems so strange to refer to him this way, but it seems, one, it seems that Hitler, the character Hitler, um, was often entering the frame. Like you never you really saw him already in the frame. He was sort of jumping in. Was that always something that was done in camera, or did you often do in framing in the cut? Because it always felt like he was sort of popping in and surprising the audience. Yeah, no, I think that was that was pretty designed in the shoot. Um, I mean, we did we toyed with the idea of you know would he appear? We wanted to be clear that he was imaginary Hitler, and we weren't trying to do a portrayal of actual Hitler. So, I mean, the the kind of motivating thing is is in the beginning of the film anyway. He he appears when. Jojo needs him. So when Jojo's at a low point, you know, even in that opening scene, trying to buoy himself up for this Hitler Youth camp, that's when Adolf appears to kind of give him a, a pep talk. And he always pops into frame. So, yes, in, in that scene, he pops down into frame. The next time we see him, he's popping out from behind a tree. You know, when he appears after Jojo first meets Elsa, you know, he's just suddenly there in the room. So... I think mostly that was all design. That wasn't really something that we came to in the edit. Yeah, it almost seems to sort of bring an energy to the character to make you sort of, like you said, it's it's all just a heightened kind of funny take on everything. The other thing that I noticed, uh, a lot of wide shots, a lot of, you know, you have some really fascinating, interesting sets, locales to look at, and just a lot of just staying on a wide shot and just appreciating. Like one thing that just comes to mind is the uh, the pool scene. Like I seem to remember right. you guys sort of sitting on a wide shot for a while there and just letting the audience really enjoy the performance that's taking place. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we were really conscious of, of trying to preserve, you know, because Tyke always shoots these beautiful, static, very formal wides. You know, often the characters will be um, relating to each other in profile to us. So, I mean, part of the trick in the edit was to try and preserve that but keep the rhythm because the other thing about his films in general, but I think especially this film, it sort of has a breathless kind of rhythm that's um, somehow born out of Jojo's point of view. You know, he's kind of this excited little 10-year-old. And especially when Adolf is in frame, he's, you know, things are traveling at the speed of his thoughts. So the trick with some of those wide shots sometimes was to try and keep that rhythm up if it wasn't there in the, in the takes on the day. We would sometimes do a little bit of stitching and those shots are great for that because they're locked and you can kind of, you know, cut out one part of the frame and tighten things up a little bit if you need to, or even mix performances if you need to. Was there a lot of, uh, how was the coverage and was there a lot of improv that went on that you had to work with or was everything pretty much tight to the script? No, there, I mean, the, the script was, was tight in terms of it was a great template, but Taika, I think, always likes to improv a bit, even as a process thing. I think it helps kind of loosen people up. So it was certain, you know, with certain actors, uh, all the comedians, Stephen Merchant, Rebel Wilson, um, Sam Rockwell to a degree. So there would be different kind of approaches to direction and performance, depending on the, the performer. You had very kind of, you know, anytime Rosie and Elsa, Scarlett and Thomason were in a scene, they would just run the scene. But if you had one of these comedians in, 
then there would be constant kind of rewinding and, and trying other offers. And then with the kids as well, there was a lot of interaction with Taika trying to get the, the performances and the cadence that he was after. So we wound up with a lot of material and we used script sync um, and some, to some degree phrase find to kind of keep track of all of that. So one of our assistants, Shelby Hall, was, was just busy on script sync the whole time, kind of typing up all of those improvs into a script of sorts and marking them. So we'd always be able to find that stuff. And then it was, you know, just a question of, of still trying to keep true to the narrative of the script because um, sometimes you'd have amazing improvs that would just wander off down some some tangent that you couldn't possibly get them back on track. So um, it was always a balancing act. You know, we could have made a very long, rambling, straight comedy, but, you know, we always had in mind that the comedy was there to serve the story and to sort of slowly lead us into a kind of much more emotional, heartfelt drama. Because Taika's not just the director, he's also the star. Or he's he's wearing two hats, um, three if you count writer. Does that change the way that he works with you with dailies or early cuts? Do you, are you sort of left to your own devices because he's so busy still during principal photography? Yeah, absolutely. He's. I mean, he was just exhausted, I think, at the end of those days. There's so much going on. So we try, I mean, I think also just as an approach, both of us, I like to stay away from set and I think he likes to stay away from the cutting room during the process during the shooting process. You know, for me, it's a question of kind of getting distance as kind of the first audience member for the um, for the dailies. So I want to view them without kind of any foreknowledge of what's outside the frame, you know, who was having a bad day, how long a shot took to get set up. And I think he really appreciates having that kind of fresh set of eyes on the daily. So, yeah, he leaves me to it through the shoot. And then I think I had two weeks to assemble. I, I had to also move the edit from Prague to LA in that time. And he really encouraged me to to try and do a pretty tight assemble. In other words, he was happy for me to drop scenes, happy for me to drop dialogue, and just try and put forward a watchable version of the film for that first pass. But I think it was still, you know, two hours plus, maybe 240. Even. It was massive. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the process. And then through the edit, we just run this relay of trying to, you know, he'll go away, work on another project, come back to it fresh, and then we will also screen a lot. So that's the other way that we try and get fresh eyes on it. What were the impressions in the early screenings? I'm kind of curious. Uh, really good. Like, the tricky thing with the film was, you know, I think it was always sitting at, like, it felt like an 80%, 90% movie, but to to get that last kind of 10% to make it something really memorable, that was the challenge. But, you know, most people, we start with sort of friends and family. We start with kind of filmmaker people. So they're, they're used to watching an offline edit and they usually have, you know, lots of interesting thoughts. But generally the, the response was always really positive. You said it's an 80, 90 percent film. Can you quantify what that missing 10 percent was that you had to change? It's really hard to quantify. But one thing Taika always does is he shoots. He always puts aside time and money in the schedule to shoot pickups. So through the editing process, you start to realize what you're missing. And so we put a lot of energy into the start of the film and the end of the film. And they, because he knew it was the, the sort of last bite at the apple, he went and shot, you know, maybe three versions of the opening scene and three versions of the last two or three scenes back inside the house between Jojo and Elsa. And it just gave us the options to, to kind of craft, you know, what we felt was the most emotionally resonant ending and what was the most satisfying opening because the other thing that we found so adolf wasn't originally in in that opening scene and the other thing that we found when we put him in there was we gave jojo a um a sounding board to express his fears and insecurities and, and he went from appearing to be a total fanatic to you kind of got an insight into his vulnerabilities so as things things like that came out of um pick up certainly and then and i guess tone that tonal shift from comedy into drama was always on our mind and we were constantly trying things you know some people felt um some people felt that once we went to drama we shouldn't go back to comedy at all we did take a lot of comedic beats out of the last act but we also tried to stay true to the spirit that the film had opened in so you would feel like you weren't you know suddenly leaping into another kind of movie 
so there was there was that and, and conversely also making sure that we struck their kind of opposite keynote up front so we made sure that we the scene that really does that for me is the the scene that jojo and us are walking uh, jojo and rosie walk into the square and they find the bodies of some resistance fighters hanging and that kind of it creates a counterbalance to all the fun that we've had so far he suddenly puts the brakes on the film and you go okay well sure this is a comedy about nazis but this is what nazis do and and it tips a hat towards where the film is heading so it was it was always kind of trying to keep all of those balls in the air all the way through the movie. So you're having fun, but you're aware of the real dangers at the same time. And then, a, you know, slow kind of shift, gear shift from comedy into drama. And that's what we were constantly tweaking throughout the cut. Well, it was very effective and it was very graceful how you handled it. And you reminded me as you're talking about that scene with Jojo and Rosie walking to the square what makes the film pay off so well is that it's funny and it's lighthearted and, and the performances are amazing, but then you are at times hit with these, oh, this is the reality of what was really happening. But when you do that, for example, the uh, people that were hanged in the square, you never see faces, you never see, the, it is not a gory film, it is not a grisly film. The tragedy and the horror just comes through in the act, not so much in any kind of shock value. Was there any discussion about that when you were talking to Taika? Uh, I, yeah, there was, I mean, Taika's... I mean, I think for starters, he's just a bit squeamish. Like, he's not a big gore and guts kind of guy. Um, but it was never something that we wanted to be hitting people over the head with with what what had happened to these people. Um, I think just the merest suggestion was enough. You know, you see some feet dangling in frame, you know what that means. Um, we did have options to do more, but um, we elected, you know, to, to keep it to the barest suggestion. Because also, because the world is, of the film is so much from Jojo's point of view, and he has been so brainwashed by this propaganda, I think some of those little things that burst that bubble, they, they just barely poke through, you know, and, and it's enough for an audience to clock them. But sometimes he's a little bit slower to, to pick up on those things. Well, you've used the term point of view a few times now, and it reminds me of a discussion I had with another editor who was very intent or, or just belabored the point that something that editors really need to pay attention to is the balance between what a character understands and what the audience understands. And, and you know, do you know something that Jojo doesn't know? Are you learning along with him? Were there ever times when you thought, okay, this, we need to tip the hand to the audience, but Jojo can't know, or this is something where we need to, the character needs to experience it at the same time as the audience? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of debate about, um, you know, for, for me, at some points in the edit, I felt like I wanted to be a bit purist about his point of view, so we should never see anything that he doesn't see. But the exceptions to that were the scenes between Rosie and Elsa up in, up in the attic. And the first one we absolutely needed for narrative purposes. We needed to know that Rosie didn't know that Jojo knew, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I felt like we got away with that a little bit because he was kind of listening in. Uh, we show him downstairs, although he can't necessarily, uh, we were not saying that he can hear the whole conversation. We kind of bookend it with a look from him. Uh, and then we had a lot of debate about the second scene between the two of them. But it just, it, it gave Elsa's character so much. Um, and it really pays off by the end of the movie, I think. To know, you know, some of the kind of, to have a sense of, you know, what Rosie's, dream for her might have been and what her own dreams for herself might be so we kind of decided it was okay to waver from that path a little bit if it was Elsa's point of view because hers is also an important point of view in the movie but yeah point of view is is kind of it informs all of your decisions whether it's the team music that we found or the rhythm of the film being a little bit breathless and almost ADD it really kind of feels like this whole world that you're seeing is Jojo's world. Well, since you mentioned temp music, why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because the music in it is certainly is a character unto itself. Uh, what kind of decisions, what kind of tracks did you choose early on for temp music? Yeah, I mean, that was, um, that was really tricky because I think we didn't want it to sound like any of the other movies about the period or about those events. Um, it needed to have its own sound. So we didn't... I tried to avoid any other soundtracks and in digging i found this whole suite of 
works for children's ensembles by Karl Orff. And I knew Tyke would be into that because he's a massive Badlands fan. Um, and although it wasn't like the it wasn't like the Glockenspiel kind of stuff that's in Badlands, but it was more sort of small ensembles of flutes and drums, and it had a very martial quality, but it was also just a bit off and tinny and innocent. And so that kind of formed the backbone of JoJo's themes and JoJo's character. And then there was some harp works by Henri Mathieu for Rosie, this kind of gentler mother's theme. And maybe the couple of exceptions, I did use a little bit of the third man score for her as well. This kind of fun zither when she's um, dancing and whatnot. And then, of course, there were needle drops and, and source cues. And in previous movies, I've had a lot to contribute to that. But on this one, Taika really had it locked down in terms of he knew that he wanted the Beatles up front. And he knew he wanted um, Heldon, the Bowie tune at the end. And so it was really just a question of filling in the blanks in between. He kind of... He'd sketched out like a, a great kind of soundscape that I just needed to follow his lead, really. And that's where we found the Roy Orbison track. So so we had three English language pop songs sung in German by their original artists. Yeah, it was very effective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that scene in particular for me, um, it's so it's almost syrupy. But, you know, you know, if you watch the movie, it's kind of uh, we take that relationship to a kind of peak of sentimentality and then we bring you back to earth this isn't the first time that the nazis or adolf hitler have been you know satirized or parodied going all the way back to charlie chaplin and the great dictator uh, or the producers but this film doesn't seem to really borrow anything stylistically from those when you were talking to taika about this and again it's such a hard thing to explain to people did he tell you hey you should you know watch these movies or or study this or, or read up on that to give you a better sense of what I'm going for here? Not those movies, no. Um, I mean, we're aware of them, obviously. Can't not be aware of The, the Great Dictator and the producers, but um, I think he also always wants to kind of strike his own tone. And he did, he gave me a few um, nods towards uh, tonal references that he reminded me to watch everything by Hal Ashby, which um, probably Harold Maud is the one that kind of has the most resonance for our film. Uh, he also talked about um, the mother in Alice, the, you know, the main character in Alice doesn't live here anymore as a kind of reference point for Rosie. And um, for Elsa, he talked about Heather's, uh, you know, this kind of cool, at least on the surface, this this cool, harsh, cynical, tough teenager. I've seen some interviews you've done where he referenced Heather's and Mean Girls. And I, you know, having seen the film... I thought, where are they going with that? Like, and now that you explain it as Elsa's outward cool, I can kind of see that. It was very useful because, um, you know, Thomason gave us a great range of performances, and there was a there was a very whimsical, um, girlish side to her character as well, which we do visit in a couple of key scenes. But for her to be, again, it was a question of point of view. So we, the other thing that we talked about in pre production was. Um, the scene where Jojo finds Elsa and we always talked about it as a kind of horror film within the film because Jojo has been so brainwashed. He really, you know, for him, she really is a monster. Uh, it is basically the most terrifying thing that he could find in the walls of his house. So we did talk about that as being kind of a horror movie, but still from this kind of innocent child's point of view. So it wasn't going to be like a really gnarly contemporary horror, like the ring or, mm-hmm. or anything. It was, um, you know, we used a little bit of Bernard Herrmann and we kind of um, leaned into the jump scares, but it was more fun. Uh, and that was a big process in terms of the temp scoring and then in terms of Michael's score as well, into hitting all of those beats. And I guess I'm thinking particularly about things like her fingers coming down the stairs, the, the banister, um, in time to the music. All of that stuff was really fun. For the most part, and I could be remembering poorly, I mean, it's a testament to you. My my notes on this film are terrible because I enjoyed it so much. I just was not, I couldn't, I <laughs> was really, watch it again. I was really engaged. Yeah, I do. I would love to watch it again. I can't wait to watch it again. Um, but I had a note about, there is a scene with Jojo and Elsa where it's a, like a seamless edit sequence where you're, the camera's panning in like a 360. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think I, I had, I had in my note post-war seamless 360 edit sequence and I, 
reading it that way, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm hoping that you do. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of a callback to the great, um, I think it was 720 degree shot that that Taika did in Hunt for the Wilder People, which I believe he came up with on the day. So it, it was kind of a callback to that in terms of stylistics. And it was also the montage that you're talking about. There are some other scenes in, in the montage, but really it is just time passing and the two of them coming closer together through familiarity and also because they're all that the other one has. You know, it really is just the two of them at that point in the movie. So that panning, constant panning, you know, allowed us to zip through a couple of different setups and show them doing various things uh, it, it's not a single take it is unlike the wilder people one actually was more or less a single take but this one because we had both characters quite close to the camera you could see them we did multiple passes but they would so each pass would be we get maybe three bites of them they'd run you know i guess around the back of the camera i wasn't there when they were shooting but they'd run out around the back of the camera and, and they'd strike another pose and so we'd get you know, three from one pass, and then the next pass, we'd get the next three to fill in the gaps in between. So, we, yeah, we wound up stitching together maybe maybe six or seven different pieces for that. We did have a th- full 360, and we had another one downstairs, but it, I think you get the message pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so long an audience can watch a camera panning around a room. Oh, you made it work. Um, there is... Let's see. Again, I want to be careful not to to give too much away, but I also I think this is an important thing to talk about. That there's a lot of attention paid to a character's shoes during the early part of the film. They're very distinct looking shoes, so you pay attention to them. And then later on in the film, you you realize why it was important that you were aware of those shoes. You're gonna have to be careful as the editor that that I walk away knowing that that I've paid attention. You've you've shared that with me enough so that later on when I when you have to pay it off. That's all I need to know. It's a balancing act for sure, not to overcook it, but also not to undercook it. Like it, it was a great joy. That was, you know, each time we tested the film and people responded to that, and you didn't even need to talk to them. You hear it in the room. People gasp at that moment, the moment that they see those shoes for the last time. So we always knew whether we were nailing it or not. And I think we had, we probably had versions with less on the shoes, we probably had more. But actually, I think it's it's a testament to how smart audiences are because I I believe the only in the film two times or three times if you if you know if you count the last time three close ups on the shoes is all it took for people to clock whose shoes they were. You had talked about using script sync and phrase find to help organize in a lot of the improv material. Any other tools or techniques in the avid that you relied upon to to help tell the story? Yeah, I mean, the, those were important ones. That was my first time using script sync, and I'm I'm going to use it on every movie from here on. I mean, I always just watch the dailies top to tail to begin with, and that's how I cut. But when you get into the room with the director, it's really handy to be able to either bring up, you know, 18 different takes and reads of a, of a line. You might want to change the audio out or something. Or in this case, yeah, a lot of improv. So knowing what all the variations, you know, fairly swiftly knowing what all the variations are. And the key thing for us was, you know, that's a great joke, but we weren't cross-shooting. So do we have the corresponding response from the other scene participant? You know, so um, quite often we would we would find that we'd have to sort of steal looks from Jojo, maybe listening to Taika directing or to kind of sell a reaction to a joke that was only done once. Other tools? Uh, definitely. I think I sort of hinted at it earlier, but in terms of trying to get that very precise rhythm to the film, but without constantly cutting, which we, we do in some scenes, but um, being able to hold some of those wider shots or even to stay on a close-up, we used um, Fluid Morph quite a bit, and sometimes just a bit of stitching if it was a wider shot, and also some you know some little speed ramps sometimes to just either elongate a pause or contract it. So those were yeah those were some of our go-tos over the course of the movie. So you've worked now with Taika. This is like the third 
feature, but you've also done some television with him. You, you've been together for a while. Yeah. How has your process with him evolved as you've gotten to know each other better and, and gotten to know your crafts better? Um, what would you say has changed the most from when you first joined up with him to uh, to JoJo? I mean, I think there's a confidence that you kind of build with any director over the course of, of a couple of movies or over the course of working together for a while. So he really is pretty happy to leave me to it for long stretches these days he really just wants you to keep coming up with with ideas and you just kind of keep throwing ideas at him until something sticks and something feels like it fits in his world and his kind of unique tone that he has so that's kind of developed i think over the course of the movies other things that have changed i guess on this film we had a lot more coverage than we ever had you know a typical scene on wilder people would be three setups it'd be a wide and two close-ups or something and on this movie, we had just an abundance of, we had two cameras shooting off and we weren't cross shooting, but we'd often have two cameras aimed at a subject, uh, sometimes three on some of those battle days and sometimes a second unit splitting off doing stuff. So there's just a huge amount of material. Is that a side effect due to uh, an increased budget or just the nature of the so. story? I think so. I mean, it was, Jojo was, was still pretty tight budget, but it was compared to a, a tight New Zealand budget. <laughs> it was a bit more luxurious. And that's where I noticed the difference was um, was just a, he was able to amass a huge amount of material. And then it was a question of, you know, sometimes in a scene, trying to maintain that tone that he's established in some of the other movies, like not, not try and overcomplicate the cutting just because we had the coverage, but try and kind of keep it to that, that quite simple, disciplined coverage map that he developed on some of those earlier movies you very casually mentioned us so then we just moved the project from prague to los angeles like it was just you hopped on the plane and left <laughs> and i'm i'm wondering uh, what really goes into moving editorial from location to your camp where you're going to actually edit do you change yeah. personnel do you ship drives is working remotely fortunately we had an amazing first assistant editor um and daniel nussbaum who wasn't on from the start in Prague, but came on maybe a week or two ahead of that um, migration process. Uh, so by the time I was able to really just keep cutting, uh, by the time that I hit the ground in LA, he had the project cloned and set up and all my media was there and everything was rendered and we were good to go. Um, the other thing, though, that we did in that week is we switched from stereo to 3.1, which was a bit of a nightmare to, to do in a short space of time. Mm. <laughs> but worth doing, on Daniel's recommendation, actually, worth doing just to to help kind of separate the dialogue through offlining. But also we went to, we did all our previews without any temp mix. So everything that the audience saw was or heard was um, what we did in the Avid. And that's something that I'm kind of proud of. It, it really held up, I felt like, as a cinematic experience for a test audience. You know, it wasn't, we didn't have to, I mean, we, you know, you always make the caveats and you tell them that it's an offline edit, but um, it really felt like it had a, a cinematic feel when we took it to those screenings. So I was, I was glad to be in 3-1 and it's something I'm going to try and keep doing over the next few movies. So what would stop you from doing 5-1 then? Uh, it's just, you know, it's a lot more tracks and it's a little bit more complicated. I think 3-1 is just enough to give us that separation that we are not constantly battling to remix the dialogue. You know, my next movie, there's a lot of wind machines and it's very noisy and just putting the, being able to put the dialogue through the center speaker and flip all the music out the sides and all the atmoses and whatnot just gives you that much more separation without having to go through a mix. I mean, I'm open to 5-1. I haven't, maybe I should not knock it until I try it. Well, talk to Daniel about that. Okay. <laughs> and I know Daniel and Shelby, and they'll be thrilled they both got name-checked in this. Oh, cool. I should also name-check um, some other people, some of our additional editors, um, Alan Baumgarten and Jana Goskaya. Jana's been with Taika since the get-go, really, and she always comes in and does a couple of weeks of just a, a full Yana pass on on the movie. And, you know, we take that and kind of go, okay, what do we want to use here? It's always a way to get a fresh perspective and kind of test your assumptions on a film. So that was a wonderful opportunity for us. And, and this time, for the first time, I was able to be in the, in the same building with her for a little while. It was really nice to have another editor to bounce off and talk about the film with inevitably by the time we bring her on we've already experimented quite a bit with structure and 
and with characters if we want to reform a character. So it's really a lot of it is being tough on jokes on a scene. And then it's a question of, you know, do we like it? And also, does it fit in the film? Does it have the same kind of tone as what we've established? But it's very useful to just kind of shake you out of. I always try and take the note, you know, like even if I even if I don't um, use what she's done, say she's cut a, a joke right down, I might think, well, fuck it, let's drop the joke, you know. Um, if she's chosen a different performance, I'll try and understand why. So it's kind of like getting notes, but you get them in a very concrete form. Well, we've talked a lot about the film you're on now, and rightfully so, but what we haven't talked much about is your earlier days. And um, one of the things that stood out to me is you had worked on some kids' television. And I wondered if that helped you in working with the uh, the kids' performances in JoJo. Right. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it. But yes, I've done a lot of work with kids uh, remotely, and it is always a challenge, I guess. Um, what you find with kids is, and it was true of this movie, is you get these incredible nuggets of just absolute genuineness if that's a word um and then you have to build the scene around it you know so so some kids you'll find that they're 90 percent of the time they're like delivering their lines either down the barrel or off to a bird in the sky sometimes you know <laughs> but then you get these little nuggets and, and then you just kind of have to build the, the scene around those what was it that made you want to be an editor or at least get into this business in the first place Man, I don't know. I mean, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> well, um, the Big Bang of I mean, your career. The Big Bang for me was, I mean, my my family didn't have a television out of, you know, maybe um, 10% happy, good values and 90% miserliness. So I was obsessed with TV from an early age. I never learned to, to play the piano because my mum would send me to piano lessons and I would just sneak down the hall past the room where the piano teacher was working with the previous student and go and watch the TV <laughs> for an hour. And my dad, uh, when my parents split, my I would have weekends with my dad. And um, he didn't really know what to do with me, I think. So he would just take me to the movies and he would just take me to see what he wanted to see. So all these art house movies I saw, um, Night on Earth, I saw Delicatessen, um, I remember seeing some crazy Swedish film where a guy gets his penis chopped off. It was, it was some pretty intense stuff for, you know, like a eight, nine, 10 year old to see, but it did give me um, just a love for the cinematic experience. We'd always go and like have Chinese food afterwards and talk about the movie. And, and that kind of hushed sort of almost church like atmosphere in the movie theater. I really loved. So that's a long way to, to to tell you, you know, like what got me interested in the movies. So Tom Eagle's not much of a piano player, but a hell of an editor. <laughs> yeah, I guess. There's always time, right? Absolutely. Maybe one day I'll learn. How about that? All the way from New Zealand, our new best friend, Tom Eagle's. Jojo Rabbit is in select theaters, so select a theater and go see it. I think you'll enjoy it. I certainly did. I also think you'll enjoy the new media composer. It's got one of those cool dark modes that all the kids are raving about. So check it out and see what I mean. There's a link right in the show notes that'll take you right to it. Tell them I sent you. And as long as you're telling people things, tell them about the rough cut. So more people can learn about the very talented people, like Tom Eagles, that are out there making these movies and TV shows that we all know and love. Tom, if you're listening, and you better be, thank you for your time today. We loved having you over. And for the rest of you, this is Matt Fury inviting you to drop back in again next week for another heart-pounding, nail-biting episode of The Rough Cut.